Um, here's the one last chart I do want to show you, which we've looked at this in the past, and I'll jump into the blog post. Which of the following statements best describes your views on when the biblical rapture will occur? This was a poll taken by LifeWayResearch.com. I can't remember when it was taken, but it's not that old. Among Protestant pastors, pre-tribbers make up 36%. Um, the concept of the rapture is not to be taken literally makes up a whopping 25%. Post-tribbers make up 18%. Mid-tribbers, 4 Pre-wrath, 4 Preterism, 1 And none of these, 8 so that was the survey that shows that pre-trib is still the king. They still rule the roost. All right. Having said that, let's um, close out topic number 10 by actually throwing pre-tribulationism under the bus. Yeah, I said it. Okay, we're not really going to do that. We're not going to throw them under the bus. But what we are going to do is we're going to allow Robert Van Campen and Reverend Roger Best, who are two pre-rathers, they're going to severely challenge the pre-trib view. Since the pre-trib view is the most popular view, it's the one you're going to hear all over the internet or you're going to hear in most churches, you're going to get if you go to seminary. It's the view that pre-rathers attack the most. It's the one that they um, try to disprove the most. It's almost like pre-tribbers and pre-rathers are um, what we might call um, arch rivals. In reality, the pre-tribbers and the post-tribbers are really the arch rivals of days gone by. They're the ones that have just been going at it for the longest time. And the pre-rathers are not old enough to have a, a, a dog in the fight just yet. We're so Johnny-come-lately new, we pre-rathers, that many Christians aren't giving us a serious um, consideration just yet. But after my study on making a case for pre-wrath, I hope to change your mind, hope to give you some cause to consider that pre-wrath is a, uh, a serious view that needs to be taken seriously. Okay, so let's just read this verbatim, and it's self-explanatory, and this will close out our um, eschatology study. This will probably take, like I said, the full 30 minutes just to read this. So, questions for a pre-tribulationist. If your pre-trib view is so rock solid, and it's really what is being taught in the Bible, what do you make of these of the following questions? Okay, so let's go through this. And I'm doing this, like I said, to uh, push us right into uh, making a case for the pre pre wrath position. This is a great way to close out by challenging the pre trib. The pre wrath position continues to gain support as serious Bible students examine it in light of Scripture. For that is for that is the crucial test and is why the Bereans, quote, received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17.11 The important factor is not what we may teach or believe, but rather what does scripture say when we take it for what it says. We need to read the language of scripture in its normal, natural, customary usage as we're careful to take it in context and then compare scripture with scripture. Too often, Christians are not like the Bereans and are led astray and, quote, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, right? Ephesians 4.14. We need Bereans who are faithful in saturating themselves with the word of God and willing to check out everything they hear to see if indeed it is truth. All right, let's keep reading. We're thankful for many who we hear from who are excited about seeing what God really says about end-time events. One of the many encouraging comments to us was made by Dr. Walter Kaiser. Right There's a famous name there. The former dean of faculty at Trinitary Seminary who made the observation that the pre wrath position is the only prophetic position that properly understands and utilizes Old Testament prophecy concerning the day of the Lord, which is a major theme of end-time events, the day of the Lord. We'll get into that in time. He also stated that if the fathers of dispensationalism had had the choice between pre-trib and pre-wrath, Dr. Kaiser genuinely believed that the pre-wrath position would have gotten their vote hands down. Dr. Kaiser understands the pre-wrath position as he listened to two five to six hour presentations of the pre-wrath position that we gave to the department heads of Trinity Seminary several years ago. Remember, the blog post that we're reading, which is available at www.sologroup.org, is written from a pre-wrath perspective, although like we found out last week, 
it's entirely possible to describe what appears to be a pre-wrath position without even calling it pre-wrath. If we simply take what the Bible teaches and take it in its normal, customary, literal, um, hermeneutic sense, reading verses as they, as they would naturally be read without trying to read theology into it, um, and corroborating scripture against scripture, um, then we appear to walk away with a pre-wrath perspective. And that's what I hope to convince you of in topic 11. Let's continue. The pre-wrath position on the timing of the rapture of the church is often questioned, especially by pre-tribbers. So, here we have now this um, pre-wrath position taking a shot at pre-trib. And indeed, most of the pre-wrath um, rhetoric that shows up on the internet and shows up on YouTube is indeed designed to dismantle pre-trib perspectives. Um, some of it goes after post-trib, but the majority of it, the lion's share of all of the um, discussions that you're going to read about in, in books and on blogs, websites such as the one I'm borrowing right now, they are typically trying to challenge the pre-trib view, and for good reason. Number one, it's the most popular view, and it's but it's not just the context of, hey, we're going to beat you because we want the top spot. That's not driving the, pre the pre-wrath perspective. Instead, as we're going to find out, pre-wrath is driven by a sincere desire to warn genuine Christians from otherwise going into what could be um, unnecessary amounts of suffering and loss when they otherwise could be more prepared and could also prepare their friends and family members for the time that's going to hit planet Earth uh, possibly very soon. So let's keep reading. Many find it difficult to give up their traditions. We're talking about Christians, obviously. Um, what they have been taught or perhaps what they have what they have taught themselves. So we're talking about pastors and um, uh you know, Bible study group leaders and things like that. The pre wrath position is simply an enhancement of the historical position held by the early church fathers. So I talked about historical premillennialism in contrast to dispensational premillennialism. The pre tribulation position, on the other hand, is a relatively new position, gaining first gaining popularity in the late 19th century. Um, so let me read that again. The pre-tribulation position, on the other hand, is a relatively new position, first gaining popularity in the late 19th century. Again, I don't know if this is merely what we what we'd call um straw manning, where you create an easily dismantable, an easily knocked downable, and in, in other words, a weak version of your opponent's uh, position, so that you can knock it down, a weakened version of it. For pre rathers to continually highlight the fact that pre-trib is a Johnny-come-lately position almost, to me, smacks of being insulted by the fact that pre rathers are also referred to as a new position, relatively new. And, of course, if you've studied any biblical topics at all, any, any, um, any eschatology studies or anything like that, you know that the older a position is, the usually the more weight is given, the more established it is, because it's already been considered by more and more Christians down through history. So you don't want to just jump on, sh jump ship to a position, jump on the bandwagon of a new position. So it it's easily seen that the pre wrath can fit the description of a brand new position. I can almost hear the pre wrath pre tribber saying, "What?" You pre rathers you're calling us a new uh, a, 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 a new position? You guys are the newcomers. You guys are the, the, are the newbies. What do you mean you're calling us a new position? At least we've been around for um, you know more than 100 years, but you guys haven't even been around for, for more than 50. Okay, yes, uh, part of those accusations are true. The label pre-trib is relatively new. Um, Marvin Rosenthal is the father of pre wrath position. Uh, Mar uh, Robert Van Campen is a one of the considered one of the fathers of the pre wrath position. So yeah, I, I get it. I get it. So I don't want to sling mud and just say, well, you need to throw them out because they're brand new. That's not what I want to do. All right, let's keep going. Those who attack the pre wrath position more times than not have never read the sign. Remember the book, The Sign? I'll flash that in post production as well. We're going to continue to use reuse that resource in these studies uh, because it was um, the book that was engineered and authored by uh, Robert Van Camp, the late Robert Van Camp, and he passed away, I think, 1999. And he is a student of Marvin Rosenthal. 
And that's why I call the two of them the fathers of the pre-wrath position. Since then, many other fine Bible teachers have come along, not least of which are um, Alan Kirshner, um, Aaron Eggman, and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Cooper. I can't remember his last name, though. So there are a number of pre-wrath teachers on the scene that are well worth um, studying under and, and researching. And Ariel Hanavi, yeah, he's a pre rather too. But The Sign um, is a book that a lot of pre-tribbers simply haven't given a serious consideration yet. They've either never read it, they never considered the position, or they fear the consequences if they adopted the position, consequences they are unwilling to endure. For these reasons, they aggressively try to shoot the position down without really understanding it and how it is arrived at via the teaching of Christ and Paul. Let's continue. Because of several books and articles that have been written against the pre-wrath position by Christians which dogmatically maintain that they take Scripture for what it says, um, this blog says that we have compiled a list of a few of the problems with pre-tribulationism. These must be answered both logically and biblically if one is to have real biblical integrity concerning the view he is espousing. Perhaps this list of issues will be helpful to those who are asking us, quote, how do we get our pre trip pastor to honestly consider the problems associated with what he is teaching? End quote. After all, it is the lives of the flock they are told to shepherd and protect that are directly at risk if their position is wrong. Correct? If pre-tribulationism is true, these problems must be answered honestly from Scripture with logical, unforced answers that do not contradict other passages. Biblical truth does not spawn confusion. If, however, pre-tribulationism cannot be clearly argued and substantiated from Scripture, pastors must have the right to teach their conscience on this matter without the fear of reprisal from their fellowship leaders. Lives of God Lives of God's elect are at stake, right? Matthew 24, 21 through 22. Not some remote doctrine that will have no severe consequences if one is wrong. I mean, so let me stop and explain that for a second. If pre-trib is correct, then we don't have to worry about the errors of pre... We don't have to worry about the errors of mid... We Christians, we genuine believers. If pre-trib is correct, then we Christians don't have to worry about the errors of mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib because we will be gone before any of the events of mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib hit the scene. Understand the logic there? Pre-trib is the one that has the church exiting before the 70th week even begins or initiating the 70th week events. And so if that logic is valid, if the theology is solid, then basically it, everything will work itself out because we will be gone. How? What, that's why um, the writers here say lives of God's elect are at stake, not some remote doctrine. In other words, read here as mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib. Not some remote doctrine that will have no severe consequences if one is wrong. On the other hand, if pre-trib is wrong, then the lives of God's elect are at stake because we're talking about putting people right in the middle of tribulation like mid-trib teaches or going through all of the tribulation like pre-wrath teaches or going through all of the tribulation and all of the wrath like post-trib teaches. So there is a lot at stake. We're not just talking about um, comparing um, uh, position versus position. Let's continue. Without going into any great depth, here are a few questions that concern pre-tribulationism. So I'm using the last 25 minutes to refer to these questions. This is Eschatology, a Biblical Study of End Time Events. My name is Ariel Lyman Hana V, and we're working our way through a final topic, topic number 10, where we are examining these rapture views, and we're finalizing our overview where we've looked at all four of the views that are primarily taught by today's Christian um, churches and seminaries and Bible study groups. And now we're turning to looking at the pre-trib view and ascertaining whether or not it is defensible. And we're borrowing a blog post that is challenging the pre-trib view one last time before we actually turn to topic 11 next week, 
which is making a case for the pre-wrath view. So this blog post is a pre-wrath leaning blog post. They believe in pre-wrath and therefore they're going to challenge some of the staples of the pre review. So that's what we're doing right now. Let's take these last uh, 24, 25 minutes to do just that. What is pre-trib's origin? As I mentioned earlier, it's not necessary to turn this into the primary um, uh, ref uh, refutation of pre-trib, but it's interesting nevertheless. First of all, this blog says, pre-tribulationism didn't exist before 1830, and there's considerable documentary proof that it was initially introduced in England by Edwin Edward Irving, the father of the Charismatic Apostolic Church, and not John Darby. Edward Irving probably picked up the idea of an any-moment rapture from his work on the translation of Emmanuel uh, Lukunza's book, The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty, a Catholic priest who initially wrote the book in Spanish under the pen name Rabbi Ben Ezra. In reality, with whom the pre-tribulationism position originally uh, originated really does not make that much difference other than the fact that it contradicts the first 1800 years of prophetic thought and contradicts the plain teaching of the New Testament. On the other hand, the basic tenet of um, pre-wrath, I believe it's supposed to be, uh, we've got some typos there, should be hand and tenet of, of the pre-wrath that the church will undergo the persecution of Antichrist before the return of Christ was clearly taught and consistently by early church Fathers. So this is a, a difference that is being highlighted by this point. It's not really when pre-trib came along, but rather that as somewhat of a new position, it suddenly ran um, counter and contrary to an historic position that was held to by many in the early church. Um, that it, namely that Christians are going to have to face the Antichrist. Among the evangelicals, what other basic doctrine of Scripture other than pre-tribulationism has been discovered in the past 160 years and directly contradicts the basic accepted teachings as a whole of the early church fathers? Well, there is none. Some will tell you that pre-tribulationism is a result of progressive revelation. But look out. There is a lot of baggage when you take that position, right? Well, God's just giving us more revelation. I do hold to progressive revelation, don't get me wrong. But when you take that position, um, the blog says, where do you stop and who decides where you stop, right? I mean, think about the position that the Catholic Church teaches that the magisterium has the right to continue in um, revealing revelation of Scripture and truth to the body of Messiah. So, it is a dangerous game to play where you say, well, um, maybe God's just continuing to give us more and more truth, and, um, and I have to be careful about this myself because I do believe that more and more truth is being revealed, but at the same time, we're not saying by the same vein that um, the Bible is being added to, and I don't think pre-tribbers are saying that also, but I suppose it is a valid point that could be considered. Um, that, um, you know, progressive love relation is, hey, um, God didn't tell us about it earlier, and we just need to, we're learning more and more information. I'm going to kind of call it a tie when it comes to um, talking about that perspective. But nevertheless, the uh, I didn't write this blog post. Where do you stop and who decides where? The revelation of God ceases with the completion of scriptures. That's the main point that's being brought up. And I believe both pre-tribbers and pre-rathers would probably agree on that uh, perspective. Let's keep reading. Does pre-rath, I'm sorry, does pre-trib have solid scriptural basis? Second, pre-tribulation has no clear biblical basis of support. Only problem passages such as 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 8, which is ignored, and Matthew 24, 15 through 31, which is ascribed to unsaved Israel. So, just um, in reference, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8 is where Paul tells that church that there, the day of the Lord will not happen until two things happen first, one of them being the great falling away, and the other one being the revelation of Antichrist, um, taking a seat in the temple, declaring himself to be God. The day of the Lord will not happen until these two things take place, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So this is ignored by pre-tribbers, at least according to this blog post. Or, instead of ignoring it in the rapture debate, 
What the pre-tribbers do is simply take 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with those two events that I just mentioned and move them into the 70th week and simply say that this is a description of what Paul is saying will happen prior to the second coming and not prior to the rapture. Remember, I got the fla- I need to flash this chart in front of your eyes one more time. This chart that shows that rapture in yellow is one event and second coming in blue is a second event according to pre-tribbers these two events that you're looking at on your screen right now are separated by seven years that's the pre-trib view rapture is separate from second coming almost to the extent that we're describing two second comings two separate events that both rightfully earn the label second coming or coming of christ almost as if there's two parousias and yet according to the other perspectives at least pre-wrath and also post-trib there's only one second coming there's only one parousia what do we do with these details we simply we pre-rathers we simply take these events and connect them to the single event known as parousia the coming of the Lord, spoken about in Old and New Testament scriptures. And therefore, rapture is the initiating event connected to the parousia, and second coming is the concluding event connected to parousia. But why is this relevant? Because in 2 Thessalonians, according to the pre-tribbers, Paul's warning about those two events those two signs that must in, uh, indicate that something is going to happen, those two signs are connected to the second coming, not to the rapture. So that's how they uh, get out of that. As far as Matthew 24, 15 through 31, those are events spoken of by Jesus. Matthew 15 um, starts talking about but immediately after the tri- i'm sorry but uh matthew 15 starts talking about for then there'll be um when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet let the reader understand and then from that point forward in, in matthew's um dialogue the all of the discourse there jesus builds up to this gathering event with him and the angels and the trumpet sound and the dead in christ i'm sorry he doesn't mention a a, a, a resurrection there but he does mention um, signs and uh, trumpet call and this, the what I call the cosmic disturbances in the sky, sun, moon, stars, things like that. And so what pre-tribbers do is they locate all of Matthew chapter 24, particularly the gathering in Matthew 24, 31. They call that the second coming. In other words... 2 Thessalonians and Matthew 24, 15 through 31 are a description of not the rapture and not the, the church. The elect there mentioned are unbelieving Israel and the second coming. So that's what they say. All right. So that's why um, this pre wrath blog says that a 2 Thessalonians is ignored, and it's only ignored in a tribulation i'm sorry it's only ignored in a rapture discussion it's not ignored if you have a discussion with a pre-tribber about when is the second coming then suddenly second thessalonians is going to come up matthew 24 according to uh, most pre-classic pre-tribbers is a um, second coming passage by comparison this blog continues the pre-wrath position can be clearly argued from the books of matthew mark luke 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and the book of Revelation with absolute consistency and no contradictions. I'm sorry. With absolute consistency and no contradictions, letting the student of God's word compare scripture with scripture without fear of contradicting, finding instead perfect harmony in all that is recorded in the New Testament. All right, let's keep reading. Are Matthew and Revelation for the church? or unsaved Israel. So now we're going to look at that position that I kind of carefully stopped and um, focused on just a moment ago. Third, pre-tribulationism views substantial sections of New Testament scripture as having no application to the church. In fact, many pre-tribulationists find it necessary to eliminate the entire book of Matthew, which I don't. And I and thankfully not most, pre, I, I believe, most pre-tribbers would walk back any comments about Matthew being entirely for 
unbelieving Israel or something not applicable to the church. Not least of which is the fact that the Great Commission at the end of Matthew is clearly and unmistakably for church, for uh, Christians in the church, right? Going to all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Teaching them all that I observed you, and lo, am I with you, with you always, even until the end of the age. What is Yeshua saying there? I'll flash this in post production in case I miss, in case I butchered that verse. What is Yeshua saying? Clearly, he's talking to believer, believers to take the gospel into all the world. I mean, this would make very little sense if he's only talking to unsaved Israel. It would make sense if he was talking to, say, um, remnant Israel, right? This could work, though. So we'll talk about that in time. 